Today, we are joined in studio by Wendy Bailey, who is the executive director of the Mississippi Department of Mental Health. Wendy came in and I had to get serious all of a sudden. So, <laughs> Wendy, good to be with you. Glad you're in today. Thank you for having me. We were talking um, before we came on air. You've been with the Department of Mental Health now almost 18 years, right? That's, that's correct, yes. So you've seen all sorts of evolutions in the department. Some very drastic evolutions, yes. And then in the last two years have obviously taken on this leadership role. So come with a lot of institutional knowledge coming into the role about things probably that you thought were done well and things that you probably thought, hey, we can do better. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the Department of Mental Health has been one of those departments that's been involved in some federal litigation. That's not a surprise to anybody. That's mm -hmm. um, about sort of what it looks like to supply good mental health. And I wonder just kind of out of the gate if you could give some context without getting into the litigation itself, but just the context of like, why is that so important? Why is the questions that are being raised in the litigation so important? And kind of how has the Department of Mental Health responded to it? Okay. Well, the litigation was around Olmstead, which is individuals being served in the least restrictive environment. So having the services that they need in the community versus having to be institutionalized. So if you look over the last, say, 10, 11 years with the department, um, we had back in 2011, 510 acute psychiatric inpatient beds across the state. And right now we have 280. So you can see how that has drastically decreased those inpatient beds for commitment. And then we had uh, crisis stabilization units, which are in the community, but we had about 124 beds and you had to be committed to be able to be in one of those beds. You had to be involuntary committed. So one thing that we've done is we've decreased the commitment beds, the acute psych beds, and we've increased crisis stabilization beds in the community and made those available um, for voluntary admissions. So things like that are what have been done. Um, you've seen a, a decrease in the institutional budget. You've seen a decrease in the number of beds. You've seen a decrease in the number of staff. And you've seen an increase in these community-based services, which is exactly what you know the litigation is about. Um, having the services that you need when you need them available in your community and surrounding you. And those are services such as um, crisis services like the crisis stabilization units, but things like supported employment and supported housing, um, having peer support specialists available, which are phenomenal and something I think Mississippi is very strong in, and then also having intensive services available, things like programs of assertive community treatment, or we call PAC teams. I-Court teams, which are intensive community outreach and recovery teams, these are services that are a very intense level of service that's provided to an individual, and it wraps the services around them to keep them in the community to avoid that institutionalization, which is what you want. You want a continuum of care, and you want those beds there when they're needed, but if an individual can be served in the community, that is what you want. And, and my appreciation had always sort of been that a long time ago, mental health, really, the state's response to it, and I don't just mean Mississippi, across the country, it was kind of like, okay, if somebody's struggling with mental health, institutionalization is the answer. And it seems like the rest of the country, or large portions of the country, moved away from that quicker than, than what Mississippi did. Is that a fair sort of summation? There were states that did, you know, that had expanded crisis services, of course. I think now, um, especially when you look at the southeastern states, we have more crisis stabilization beds in Mississippi than a lot of other states do. Um, also, 988 rolled out this year, which was uh, a three number um, for the national, behavior, the national Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is now called the Behavioral Health Crisis Line. And this 988 is surrounding crisis services. So it talks about how you need Need someone to talk to, someone to respond, and somewhere to go. If you have a good, strong crisis system, you have all three of those things. Well, I think in Mississippi, as states, we were having national calls looking at how this is going to roll out nationally. Mississippi was in a better position than a lot of states because we did have those three legs of the stool. Now, do we need to improve upon them and expand them? Absolutely. But we had 
you know, a good, strong crisis line and answer rate. We had crisis stabilization units, and we had mobile crisis response teams. And you have some te- um, some states that are just now starting some of this up are working to expand it. So I think Mississippi's in a much better place in the last several years than in the past. So essentially, you guys have worked to expand very quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> yes, very quickly. So, so talk to me a little bit more about 988. I, n- I know you mentioned that as an element of a larger network of support, if you will. Um, but that really is important, not just in Mississippi, across the country right now, because we have experienced this uptick and people who are suffering from significant mental health crises, right? That is exactly right. Especially since the COVID pandemic, you have seen an increase in the number of people calling. Um, so 988, um, ultimately in the long run, is supposed to be the 911 for behavioral health. So if you're having a substance use or mental health crisis, you can call 988. There are, this is a national program. Um, it was Congress introduced legislation in October of 2020, and then 988 rolled out in July 16th of, of 2022. So what happens is when you call 988, it goes to a national call center. And then it rolls, based on area code, it rolls to one of the Mississippi call centers. So we have two in Mississippi, and they are trained crisis counselors. So ultimately, you would you would reach in a crisis counselor who can be able to talk you through the crisis situation that, you're ha- that you are having. About 80% of the time, calls can be resolved over the phone. But about 20% of the time, they need to go a step further. And that's where our 988 call centers can dispatch out mobile crisis response teams to be able to go to someone in the community. Um, the, the, we are seeing an increase in the number of calls in our state to 988. We've seen an increase in the lifeline calls over the last several years. Um, but I think one of the things that Mississippi should be proud of with that is th- we have one of the top 10 highest in-state answer rates in the nation, which means if you call 988 in Mississippi, you are going to get a Mississippi-trained crisis counselor. It's not going to roll to another state. So we're in the top 10 of that in the nation. So on that, I mean, I think a lot of people used to think of that hotline, and obviously it's a new number, but it's sort of the suicide prevention hotline, right? What is sort of the breakdown of the types of calls that you're getting? Is it, is it all people who are having suicidal ideations, or are there other things that generate those calls? There are other things that generate those calls. Um, of course, it is. it has always in the past been referred to as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. They're moving away from that name to be Behavioral Health Crisis Line. Um, but you have people who are maybe in a, a suicidal uh, crisis and needs help, but you also have people who are looking for help or need connection to services, or they're calling on behalf of a loved one who may they may be worried or having thoughts of suicide and they don't know how to react or respond. So it's a, it's a multitude of, of different types of calls. I would imagine, and maybe you can speak to some of the safeguards against this, that if you've got somebody who's in a mental crisis or having a behavioral crisis um, and they're already in a, a rut, if you will, that there is some fear in calling for help because there is at least a thought that calling could compound the problem, right? Do I end up on some list? Do I end up in a situation where I am involuntarily committed? Um, and so that there's that is a sort of natural impediment. How do you guys approach that when it comes to trying to make people feel more comfortable with the idea that it's okay to seek help? I think one of the main things that we focused on in the last several years have been certified peer support specialist. So if you are in a a situation, whatever it may be, you want to talk to someone who's been in a similar situation, someone you can relate to. And that's where certified peer support specialists come in. Those are individuals who are in our state who've been through the system who have had a mental health issue or substance use issue or their loved one has, they go through a 40-hour training with our department and they're certified and they work to help others. They are peer support specialists. Hearing those stories, having someone to talk to that's been there, done that, um, is very, very important. I think 
having more people come out and talk about their own mental health and their own recovery has opened doors for others to realize, okay, it's safe for me. I can seek help. To me, that's the key is those true, real Mississippi stories and being able to relate to someone. And the idea that if you need help, you should seek help. Exactly right. right. That, that there isn't shame in it. There's not a stigma to it. We all have times in life where things are hard, exactly. and it's okay to ask for help in those situations. Wendy, can you stick around for another segment? Absolutely. We're talking to Wendy Bailey, the Executive Director of the Department of Mental Health. You're listening to Middays with Gerard Gibbert from the Element Well Studio, Russ Latino guest hosting. We're going to come back and talk to Wendy a little bit more about what's going on with the Department of Mental Health and things that you need to know as citizens. Be back in just a moment. So we're talking to Wendy Bailey, Executive Director of the Department of Mental Health. Um, I want to jump back into to the conversation that we were having before the break. We talked about how services had been expanded and some of the changes sort of away from institutionalization being the first step to thinking more on a community basis, creating a network of support. You guys have been doing that for a few years now and aggressively have moved towards that. What are you seeing in terms of results? Are you seeing more positive results out of that switch? Absolutely. The outcomes are there and you can clearly see the results. So I'll give you an example. There are intensive services that can help an individual, as I mentioned, stay out of the hospital. So PACT, Programs of Assertive Community Treatment and I-Court that I mentioned, are two of those. Um, And there's also ICSS, Intensive Community Support Services. So our goal has been to have at least one of those in all 82 counties of Mississippi, and we've reached that goal. So in for PACT, for example, the most intense level of service, you have to have multiple hospitalizations to qualify for that service. So this is an individual who's been in and out of state hospitals. So this past fiscal year, there were 760 people who received PACT services in our state. 760 people who've had multiple hospitalizations through the years. So PACT, out of those 760 that were served, 31 had to go back to the hospital. That's a 4% readmission rate. I mean, that's a phenomenal outcome yeah. for people who have had to need that high level of service. Um, intensive community outreach and recovery teams, there was right at about five to 600 served with those teams, and they had a 6% readmission rate. So, I mean, you can see that the intense service, when it's there, it's available, it's wrapped around the person, works and does prevent that institutionalization in most cases. Yeah, that's incredible because, I mean, I think about it, you and I talked uh, during the break. I've worked a lot in criminal justice reform, and one of the chief metrics in thinking about our program successful in the context of criminal justice reform is what does that recidivism rate look like, Mm -hmm. right? How likely is this person to reoffend? Because we know that 95 percent of people who are sitting in prison will one day be out of prison, right? And so sort of the efficacy of the programs that are developed really center around can they get that job? Can they get back on track? How likely are they to reoffend? And the analog here seems to be, hey, look, we have 760 people who have been in and out, mm-hmm. who have been sort of that repeat offender in the context of criminal law. And the reality is that the programs that we've built have made it such that the recidivism, so to speak, is really low. That's exactly right. The crisis stabilization units are the same way. They served a little over 3,100 people last year, 91% of the people that were served in a crisis stabilization bed did not have to go on to a state hospital. 91% of them were able to be re- go back into their communities, go back to their jobs, their families, their loved ones. They did not have to go on to a state hospital. So I, I, I arguably made a poor analogy, but hopefully it made sense. There is a natural intersection, though, between criminal justice and mental health. I talk to me a little bit about things that the state has been doing to try to recognize that there are people who suffer from mental health problems that maybe don't belong in prison, but there's a more effective way of dealing with those problems. So I think it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. I mean, one, one thing is, is you do want to have the services available when someone needs them. Um, I think training of law enforcement is very important. Mental health first aid for public safety and crisis intervention team training. So when law enforcement, law enforcement, or, um, law enforcement officers encounter that individual, that they know how to respond, that they know how to de-escalate, and they know how to react. I think that that training is so very important, that tool in that toolbox of law enforcement, because a lot of times that's that first encounter. I also think then 
that you need to have things like mental health courts where you have options other than having to go to jail, um, that you have things like mental health courts that individuals can go through. Um, drug courts have been very successful in our state and we're moving more into mental health courts now. Um, I think that's very key and that's important. Having options for somewhere to go, a lot of times an individual gets placed in jail. Um, if you have diversion centers, which we have one small one in North Mississippi and we're trying to start a couple on the coast, um, diversion centers are a place that somebody can, law enforcement or someone can can take an individual to and they can receive services, that intervention through peer support. Um, having those options available and and, and preventing that individual from ever going to jail is important. But then also if there have been, um, you know, an individual who is an offender, that you do have options like mental health courts too. And how expensive is that program now? I know drug courts have, have gotten more adopted and accepted. How expansive are the mental health courts at this point? So there was legislation passed in 2022, this this past session, um, for the establishment of some additional mental health courts. There's always been one in Hattiesburg, or the last several years there have been. Um, and, and this is going to add several more. I think it's about seven or eight that's going to be added. The Office of Administrative Courts is we're kind of partnering with them and working with the community mental health centers as well. They'll be key in that. Well, and you mentioned uh, as you were going through sort of the description of how law enforcement should approach people who may be suffering from mental health crisis, that you guys have developed essentially a mental health first aid. Is that just for law enforcement or is that something that's available to, to other people, businesses, organizations? So it's actually a national evidence-based training. It's from the National Council's Mental Health First Aid. There's a mental health first aid for adults, a mental health first aid for children, and a mental health first aid for public safety. So there's different options. And we have a federal grant to provide that free of charge right now. And then we received ARPA funds from the legislature this year for the public safety aspect of it. So our goal is teachers, um, parents, churches, any type of group, any type of setting that's interested in learning more about signs, symptoms, how to connect people to treatment, how to talk to somebody who has a mental health issue, um, just learning more about being a good community partner uh, to go through this training. It's a it's an eight-hour training, and it can be one full day or it can be two days, four hours each, and then you're certified in mental health first aid. It's, you mentioned for teachers, um, I've read, and I know you've forgotten more than I've ever read or known on this, but I've read that the crisis in, around mental health has increased dramatically in young people. Um, do you have a sense, and, and this may be uh, an unfair off-the-cuff off question, what's causing that? Like what? I, I do think that some of it is is building up coping skills with our children and our youth as for to teach them at a young age, you know, how to cope with their feelings and their emotions and what to do. I think having more awareness and openness about talking about it. Um, we have a suicide prevention campaign that's called Shatter the Silence, Suicide the Secret You Shouldn't Keep. Very straightforward. If you have somebody at your school that tells you they're having thoughts of suicide, that is not a secret you can keep. You have to tell someone. I think opening those doors like you were talking about earlier with people feeling comfortable to talk about it. Um, but I think also over the last couple of years, I mean, there's been studies that show just the results of the pandemic and job loss and, and sickness and illness in families. I mean, that's created a lot of stress um, and a lot of issues um, with children and families in general. And I think that's where we do need to focus in on recognizing those symptoms earlier. Early intervention and prevention is so key, um, especially with children and youth. So one of the questions that came in on the, the C Spire text line, um, and it kind of speaks to something we were talking about earlier, is the fear of raising your hand, right? Yeah. The fear of saying I need help. We live in a state where Second Amendment rights are important to people, um, where a lot of folks have grown up in a culture where owning guns is just part of what you do. Um, and so the, the texter basically asked the question, how do we balance an individual's Second Amendment's right and their potential need for mental health interventions? Um, and I'm curious, I'm sure you've heard this question before. So I think one key of that is to avoid that institutionalization, avoiding that commitment, having those services available so that individual can get served and receive mental health services in their community, as opposed to having to go to that higher level of care where that is, that's where it kind of becomes involved. Um, I think that's key. 
is, is, is being able to avoid that institutionalization and having those services available when someone needs it. Because there is that fear for multiple different reasons and levels. There is that fear of raising your hand and saying, I need help. You know, one thing that we talk about a lot is... Um, you know, if you have a if you have a loved one that breaks their arm or has to have surgery, you go visit them in the hospital. You bake them a casserole. You know, you 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 be that loved one that's surrounding them to help them, but you don't know how to do that necessarily when it's a mental health crisis, where we have to get to a place in society and especially in our state that a mental health crisis and a physical health crisis is the same thing. That mental health and physical health go hand in hand, and they're looked at equally. Yeah, and, and just destroying the stigmas, and there's so right. there's so many misperceptions. Uh, so I'm I'm glad that you guys are out working to address those things. I've got just a few seconds. Um, you're also dealing with a labor shortage. Absolutely. Yes. Anybody who wants to work in the mental health field, please give us a call. We have community mental health centers across the state that have job openings, and we absolutely have them at the Department of Mental Health. It is definitely a struggle. Wendy, thank you so much for coming in. Good information, hopefully helpful to our listeners. You're listening to Middays with Gerard Gibbert, Russell Tino, guest hosting. We'll be back in a moment with Senator Daniel